Good morning and welcome to this public meeting of the Consumer Product Safety Commission. This morning, the CPSC staff will brief the commission on the staff proposal for mid-year adjustments for to our FY23 operating plan based on our full year appropriations level and our plan spending. This mid-year adjustment is an annual process we undertake to align our operating plan with our appropriated funds. And as we did last year, we're also uh, taking this opportunity to realign our spending under the American Rescue Plan, otherwise known as ARPA. At the start of the pandemic, Congress provided CPSC with $50 million to spend over a five-year period. We are uh, spending those do dollars responsibly and have strength in our ports, our internet surveillance, our data systems, and our uh, safety communications. This proposal looks to preserve those gains and positions with the commission to continue the important work after the ARPA funds have been spent. Uh, and in a moment, I'm going to turn this meeting over to staff so they can brief us. Once they have completed the briefing, each commissioner will have 10 minutes to ask questions of staff with multiple rounds if necessary. Briefing us today is Jason Levine, CPSC Executive Director, and James Baker, Chief Financial Officer. Also joining us are Austin Schlick, General Counsel, Pam, Pamela Springs, Direct, Director of Communications, Dwayne Ray, Deputy Executive Director, Dwayne Boniface, Assistant Executive Director for Hazard Identification and Reduction, Brian Burnett, Chief Information Officer, and Alberta Mills, Commission Secretary. I'm now going to turn the microphone over to Mr. Levine and Mr. Baker. Good morning. Uh, today... Thank you for the opportunity to brief on our proposed operating plan alignment and mid-year review. Uh, I'll wait for our slides to come up. That's actually the memo as opposed to the, we're looking for the PowerPoint deck. No. There we go. And if you could go ahead when you're ready to slide to. Okay, here we go. Uh, so, as you mentioned, Mr. Chair, the uh, 
what's before us uh, is a an alignment based on our received uh, full year budget. Uh, but just for review purposes, in October, the commission approved the 2023 plan, operating plan. Uh, and because at that point in time, we did not have a full year budget, we did it on a, a two alternate levels, uh, one being the strict, um, uh, the strict continuing resolution level and the other being based on our most recent at that point in time, congressional budget justification of $195 million. And you can see those two levels there. Uh, following the approval in October of the operating plan in December, Congress did enact a full year uh, 2023 appropriation for us at $152.5 million, which to do the math is 13.45 more than the continuing resolution level and 43 million less than our uh, actual request to Congress. Next slide, please. So the package before you, <clears throat> before the commission today uh, has three recommendations. One is to go ahead and align the 23 operating plan with the 23 enacted level. Two is to approve projects to fund should the commission have any unexecuted balances. We traditionally do, we are anticipating, uh, and we'll talk about this in a minute, about $3 million in unexecuted balances, of course, uh, it, you can never guarantee what those numbers are going to be. And the third uh, third item is to adjust the ARPA spending and staffing in part based on that alignment in recommendation one. Next slide, please. So a little more detail on recommendation one. Uh, as noted, the 152.5 level uh, is 13.45 above our continuing resolution level, the the four major categories we propose to break that out into are pay, inflation, and related adjustments. Uh, as you may recall, there was a government-wide uh, increase of a little over 4% for all pay, um, pay non-pay infl inflation of about a million dollars. Uh, and this goes to things like contracts, interagency uh, agreements, rent increases, you know, the, the continuing increase in costs that we see every year uh, on non-pay items. The transfer of 37 uh, full-time equivalent staff from ARPA. Now that, just as a reminder, that covers a full year of salary for those 37 uh, individuals or 37 positions, I should say. Uh, and then uh, $2 million in a new grant program for the agency, the Nicholas and Zachary Burt Memorial Carbon Monoxide Poisoning Prevention Act of 2022 um, is a $2 million level. And that gets us 152. Next slide, please. So as mentioned, the unexecuted balance estimate, uh, we're not, you know, we don't know what the, what the level is or will be between now and September 30, but we are estimating it at approximately $3 million. Um, that said, uh, because we don't know the exact number and sometimes uh, even the best laid plans result in an inability to, to bring the contract across the finish line in the amount of time that we have. Uh, the staff has identified, I believe the number is 16 projects in recommended priority order totaling $5.2 million. And these would be, if approved, funded in that order again, subject to the sufficient availability of the unexecuted balance as it as it comes up and the acquisition feasibility. Next slide, please. Let's spend a little more detail sorry, uh, for and uh, I know a little bit hard to read on the slide there, but uh, this is the the list of the sixteen proposed pack uh, proposed projects. not going to go through each and every one of them. Uh, though the memo obviously does in table two. Uh, I would note that three of the first six do uh, relate to either and, I should say, and or uh, lithium ion batteries, uh, referred to here as high energy density batteries or uh, electric bikes uh, or the combination of those two, uh, in part because of the increased uh, activity we are seeing with respect to incidents 
uh, both involving uh, lithium ion batteries and micromobility products, particularly e-bikes from a fire perspective, a thermal, thermal incident perspective, as well as what appears to be increased uh, injury incidents that are not related to fire involving uh, electric bicycles and other micromobility products pro products uh, and then i would also know and there there is a a fourth project which i'll mention uh, when we get to it uh also in the um, the proposed arpa spending dealing also with with this category and then the other sort of larger picture item that i would note for the commission's consideration is we have taken uh as we traditionally do a broad approach to the types of different projects proposed to be funded uh, in part because uh, you know we, these are relying on contract uh, acquisitions that can be accomplished between now and September 30th uh, and to fill in a variety of gaps that uh, unfortunately do crop up every year uh, due to our, our limited resources. Uh, so it's you'll see whether we're talking about some of the um, the artificial intelligence machine learning projects uh, on the data and, and hazard identification side, ATV uh, project on, on rollover and down to some of the more chronic hazard analysis. You know, there's a, there's a wide variety of, of different areas that we're trying to, um, to accomplish in terms of what we can, what we can do with these unexecuted balances. And, and again, the more there is, the more we'll be able to uh, hopefully uh, get through. Okay, next slide, please. As mentioned, um, this is part of this is recommendation three, which is to adjust the the ARPA spend and staffing. Uh, this is uh, this table table four in in your memo lays out a, a projection. Well, lays out a catch up for where we are and a projection based on the transfer of 37 FTEs to our appropriated spending. Uh, so as you can see through, uh, essentially through the end of this fiscal year, uh, the, the plans as either previously spent or previously approved and spending go to uh, $38 million uh, of the 50 provided by Congress and then new one-time projects of 8.4 and 3.6 in terms of recurring. Those are also newer new projects, but they are more than one year projects, uh, which we will talk about in the next slide. So next slide, please. And so on this slide, similarly to what we were looking at before, uh, here are all 15 projects associated with uh, the, the proposed ARPA spend here uh, and they're broken out in into these two different tables uh, in terms of a one-time spend versus two-year recurring spend. These totals would bring us again, presuming the, uh, <clears throat> the the 37 staff are moved over, would bring us to a total spend of $50 million in fiscal 25, which is slightly uh, ahead of the required um, spend down of the funds, uh, but also keeping in mind, um, just as we talked about with mid-year, it's not, you know, actually finishing acquisitions um, in, in a specifically timely fashion, sometimes slips over from one fiscal year to another, uh, but we feel it is, uh, these are accomplishable task orders uh, within uh, a reasonable period of time going forward. And that's it in terms of talking about the briefing package and we stand ready to answer questions. Thank you for the briefing. At this point in time, we're going to turn to questions from the commissioners um, with multiple rounds if necessary. I'm going to recognize myself first and you know, looking over the package, I appreciate the work that staff has done to put it together and present it to the commission. And please see additional funds being proposed for research and to address the risks associated with high energy density batteries. As you said, this is an issue that has become more and more of the fore as we've seen a uh, greater number of fires um, that have resulted in deaths and injuries um, across the country. So can you provide a little bit more detail on how the staff 
uh, plans to spend the funds that are targeted at lithium ion batteries and um, you know, the projects that are there. It seems like there are a couple of different projects that would touch upon this and what we're hoping to gain from those projects. Sure. So <clears throat> thank you for the question. And, and as, as noted, there are a number of different projects, uh, but the ones that are particularly focused on high energy density batteries, I think in most in particular is, is project one um, and, and to a, another extent, project five. Uh, but this is a project that uh, will conduct, um, it, it will be a significant portion of it will be for a research study um, that will hopefully support work in the standards development area for lithium ion batteries. Specifically, it's going to provide for research on the battery packs used in e-mobility devices in response to uh, foreseeable extreme environmental, mechanical, electrical conditions. Uh, the results from the contract uh, would be, you know, deliverable research for us, which could be used in development uh, to improvements to existing standards for micromobility devices, electrical systems, and batteries. Um, and ideally help us identify some of the issues that are leading to thermal runway. Uh, not just with with e-bikes, though e-bikes will be a, a significant portion of, of the focus of that research. Uh, in, in addition, uh, with respect to um, uh, project number, sorry, I just wanna make sure I have, I have the, the number correctly here. Um, project six, I believe it is. Give me one second here. Yeah, uh, oh, sorry, project five uh, is, is a look, uh, is gonna help us look at um, the existence, of our existing data uh, with respect to an engineering review um, and a data review of incidents that we have, particularly with respect to um, fire incidents as well as looking at some non-fire incidents. But sort of those two combined, I think will provide a significant amount of information for us in terms of these thermal runway, uh, runaway incidents. I appreciate that. I know that I've been observing these areas um, and actively doing IDIs along the way as well. Um, project three in the mid-year list related to data training for artificial intelligence, machine learning, and there's also a separate project in the ARPA related to machine learning for hazardous defect identification, uh, which all appear to be interrelated. And I was hoping you can explain how those projects are meant to work together, what you hope to achieve, and are there anticipated milestones that can be used to evaluate the pro progress of those projects? Absolutely. So, um, so to answer that first part, yes, uh, the project three and the the what we're calling the mid year list and project three and the ARPA list are are in, are related interrelated projects. Um, so to try and break them down as as simply as possible, though they are a little bit complicated. The first project will provide. Um, for contractors to code somewhere between 40 and 50,000 what we call unstructured records. So this would be text that we have um, in something like a death certificate or uh, an incident report, whether it be from authorities or from con or from consumers. Um, so this would be something that isn't pre-coded in terms of how it is entered. So it doesn't specifically say uh, this incident happened on a bicycle. Uh, it just might describe something and, and as you imagine, unstructured text. So the the goal being uh, these contractors would code these this unstructured text uh, for product codes and classify the severity of the incident involved. Um, for the purpose of quality control, each record involved will be coded twice uh, by different coders. The deliverable from this contract will provide training data for the other project you mentioned. That's project uh, number three in the ARPA list. That project, um, which, which we're calling machine learning and data identification, that project will focus on using contractors to develop the program, which will use machine learning to read unstructured text and assist with classifying the product codes and incident severity from that text. So currently, the question is, why, you know, why do we need this? Currently, this sort of review and classification is either done by CPSC employees or contractors and done on a manual basis. And as you would imagine, slowly. Um, the goal when we get to the end of the project uh, will be to use that data from that first set, the coding we talked about, 
as training material for the programs developed by that second project and for testing to, to see how it's doing. When complete, uh, the idea is that the program will learn from those 40 to 50,000 records how to read uncoded unstructured text and then properly classify product codes and incident severity from the text. So currently, again, because it's done manually, the process only allows for us to do a very small number of records on an annual basis uh, in terms of what we receive. We, we have more that we receive more than we can review. Uh, if we are successful, the program would dramatically impact the number of reports which we can classify for research rules and compliance activities. Uh, now, this is going to be an iterative process. I think that's important to, to note. It's not as if when you get to the end of a year and the end of this program writing, we're done because um, it's going to need to be adjusted along the way. It's going to need to be tweaked based on how well the program does, how quickly it learns, uh, and how accurate it's it's reading of the unstructured text is. Um, but ideally, we're getting to a point where we're in a aut more automated fashion uh, with humans checking on the back end, we can uh, m much more quickly and much more comprehensively uh, identify product codes and classify severity of, of injuries and incidents uh, within the data we're receiving. So, I mean, clearly it's a, a good and strong goal. I think, as you said, it's an iterative process. So it's one that as, you know, should this be funded, um, make sure that there are milestones along the way that we can understand how things are going and um, redirect as necessary. Um, lastly, um, noting my time, uh, want to talk a little bit about the, the two funding streams that the agency is running through. You mentioned, and I mentioned the per annual preparations and the ARPA funds and, uh, the decision to recommend transferring staff from, from the ARPA funds, to the annual preparations, um, of the 5.5 million dollars proposed to be transferred to, to the annual preparations for ARPA funds. How much is related to staffing, um, and the reasoning for the approach? Sure. So, uh, 100% of the 5.5 is related to staffing. Uh, so all of it would be related to staffing. Um, the, the reason, um, for the approaches is, is laid out in the 23 operating plan, uh, in terms of ideally, actually what we, what we wanted to do is be able to transfer all 46, uh, FTEs over to, uh, to the appropriations, uh, the funds were not available. But the goal is to do this in a thoughtful manner, moving these 37 over in a way that protects staff, avoids potential disruption in operations going forward. Uh, as you know, the funds will run out or, or expire in the relatively near future. Uh, and to move staff into our operating funds uh, that allows the, the, op, the appropriations increases to um, keep everyone on board and, and maintain the momentum that we've built, uh, particularly in terms of our import and field staffs. Thank you. Um, may have more questions, but at this point in time, I'm going to turn to my colleagues. Commissioner Feldman, did you have questions? I do. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, uh, Mr. Levine and Mr. Baker for the presentation today and for all your work putting this together. Um, I do have a number of questions. We'll probably have to do multiple rounds, uh, but uh, right out of the gate on uh, priority items 11 and 14 relating to organohalogen flame retardants. I, I just want to clarify one thing. Uh, we say class-based, uh, when we say that, are, are we still talking about the subclass-based assessment that uh, the National Academies recommended? We seem to be using class and subclass interchangeably. Uh, and I've asked this question before in other contexts, but I just wanna make sure that we're proceeding pursuant to what the National Academies uh, has, has recommended as sort of the best science. Yeah, I, we'll confirm for you, but the, I believe the answer is yes, it's still subclasses. We, the, the plan has not changed. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, I want to ask about home sprinklers, um, on item 10 relating to, to home sprinklers. I'm, I'm curious about how this proposal originated. You could talk a little bit about what the genesis of that project was. Sure. Um, sorry, let me just grab it here. The, um, so, you know, our work in fire reduction is, has always been a, a, a ongoing at the commission in terms of it's, you know, one, one of the areas uh, as those of us who read, you know, the, the death reports is something that obviously is, is a significant um, hazard and, and we look for a variety of ways to address it. The home sprinkler project was uh, based on um, staff review of existing data 
uh, which suggested that um, sprinklers are highly effective, but we didn't really have um, hard um, project data that uh, allowed the ability to um, definitively assess this and definitively make the case to uh, whether it be um, uh, code coding boards across the country or other interested stakeholders for an approach that looks at um, home sprinklers uh, as a uh, effective deterrent beyond the um, beyond the lab setting and mm -hmm. beyond the commercial setting. Uh, as you're well aware, commercial buildings have had requirements, new commercial buildings have had requirements for sprinklers for, for many, many years. So how would this differ from the work that the U.S. Fire Administration, NIST, and others have already done and completed regarding residential fire sprinklers? For example, I'm aware of a, a 2000 study, uh, a seven study that, that NIST published that, that sort of looked specifically, I think, at the question that you're getting at. Um, which is to conduct sort of a definitive cost benefit analysis of residential fire protection systems. Um, and they found that that across a variety of, of applications that that these systems are sort of cost effective uh, across a, a variety of installation scenarios. Sure. So being unfamiliar with that specific study, I, you know, we'll, we can circle back. I think okay. that the, I would note if it's a 2007 study, we probably at the very least would want to update it as, as as much as we could if we're looking to talk to if okay. we're looking to talk to code boards about you know current cost benefits. I wouldn't want to recreate the wheel, but uh, I've asked my staff share this with Secretary Mills so that it'll be available, sure. and I'm, I'm happy to circulate it Thank to you. the rest of the commission yep. uh, and, and to, uh, to to staff as well. Yep. Um, on e-commerce, thank you for that. Yep. Uh, we continue to see recalled product product showing up uh, for sale illegally on secondary marketplace platforms, and that there there's only so much. And Mr. Chairman, I know you just recently sent a, a series of letters talking about this issue specifically. Uh, that, that there appears to be only so much our compliance staff is able to do um, when they're investigating these platforms manually as part of their compliance mission. Um, I've worked to expand CPSC's data analytics capabilities, uh, and there's been a strong focus on AI. So I'm I'm, I'm excited to see this continued focus, um, because this technology appears so promising uh, to spot broad trends and discrepancies, sort of precisely the things that that we want uh, uh, to identify in order to proceed with the compliance action. Um, that capability is critical to our safety mission. Not only that, but but recall effectiveness and and our enforcement efforts writ large. So on, on item number three regarding training for uh, AI and machine learning, um, would this project have applications sort of more broadly with respect to our market surveillance operations, or is it contemplated that it's sort of a little bit more narrowly targeted than that? So I I think it's important to be careful in terms of of stages of it. Uh, I think the the immediate um, the immediate application will be for the sort of information we are currently receiving, um, which is a significant amount of information. But uh, yes, ideally, you know, the tool could be trained to read unstructured text um, of similar natures. So, um, you know, if you're looking at something that's reporting something about a product and something about an injury incident, that's the goal. The goal is to be able to use this sort of technology uh, to to scan and identify far faster than we can do manually uh, items that need to be flagged and followed up by people. So yes, it, in the long run, that is the, I think that's what's exciting actually about the technology. I agree, that's exciting. I think that's a powerful tool that that we could make good use of. Yep. Uh, so thank you. Yep. Um, some of the proposed projects fall under the, the purview of the chief information officer, who I know is relatively recent uh, to, to CPSC. Uh, Mr. Burnett, I, I want to welcome you to CPSC. Uh, and, and I think that the work that you do, your office does is a critical part of our mission and comprises a significant portion of our annual appropriation. Uh, so it's important that we get it right. Uh, given the technical nature of the, the proposed project, uh, projects here, I, 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 and there's no question in here for you, I, I know that you're not at the dais right now, but given the, the technical nature of the, the projects that have been proposed, I, I just want to make sure that we're taking full advantage of your expertise as we set our priorities. And uh, again, no question, but I, I just want to ensure that you have every opportunity to provide your input on the portions of the proposal that touch your areas before we move to final consideration. Um, mindful of the time, I'm happy to yield.
obviously do multiple rounds um, as well. So if you want to stop there, we can come back again. Great. Commissioner thank you very much. Trumka, do you have questions? Uh, yes, and uh, thank you. I, Mr. Baker, my first question is to you. Uh, Mr. Levine has this nice solid placard in front of him. They gave you a piece of paper. Can we find some money in the budget to get you one of those two? I love the paper. Thank you. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, I appreciate the, the thrifty approach there then. Um, so I, I'm going to go through the, the questions in roughly sequential order, uh, starting with the unexecuted balances and, and up on uh, item one, the high energy density, high energy density batteries. Um, I, I definitely 100% support all the work that, that we're going to do to address uh, the e-bikes, you know, particularly with the lithium ion uh, battery explosion problem. And so I do like to see this item very much and, and its prominence on this list. I do want to understand more about the equipment purchases for the project. And I understand there's two equipment purchases. Can you tell me what the, those two purchases are uh, and the capabilities that we gain from them and how they can be used to support future rulemaking? Sure. Uh, thank you for the question. The um, so you're right. It, it is a it's a there's two different pieces of equipment involved. Um, the first will allow uh, staff to to significantly update our ability to measure the capabilities of a variety of micro mobility products. So we're talking about hoverboards, powered unicycles, uh, other self balancing scooters. Uh, right now, we can't um, really measure these units at the speeds that they are being sold on the market at. Uh, and we only see those speeds and those capabilities for those products increasing and getting faster. So what we need to be doing is uh, updating our systems to keep pace with these devices, uh, in particular because one of our, our observations is that the increased speed and load put on these batteries can play a role in the thermal events. So it's gonna allow us um, the first piece of equipment we're talking about, again, uh, hoverboards, unicycles, and self-balancing scooters. The second piece is for a dynamometer, uh, which will cover other consumer products with different dynamics than the ones I just mentioned, um, including some different wheel configurations, varying weight capacities, um, and ranges of speed up to 40 miles an hour. Uh, this could cover and should cover uh, e-bikes, e-scooters, uh, battery-powered accessible accessibility vehicles, go-karts, uh, children's youth ATVs, as well as ride-on to ride toys. So, um, again, this will improve our testing capabilities in this area. And, uh, again, we have concerns with the speed and load put on these batteries is playing a role in thermal events. So, those so, are the two pieces of equipment. So, the second piece of equipment you mentioned, you went through a long list of, of what we could test on that. Yep. The first one, you didn't say e-bikes. Correct. It, we can't use that first one for e-bikes? Well, it's not that we can't. It's that it's not ideally structured. It's more for, as as noted in the project, is it is for high-density batteries in the micro-mobility environment. And, and that first one is the much more expensive of the two, right? That's the $300,000 purchase? Correct. Yes. And we're not going to be using it on e-bikes? Okay. It's not necessarily structured for e-bikes. The the um, It's not to say that we couldn't, but it's better used for these other products, which, again... Um, you know, hoverboards in particular, you know, have, have had a history of, of, uh, of thermal events and as we've seen with other products. Okay. Uh, item four on the list, the ATV rollover protection, that's particularly welcome. Uh, and it, it's the last piece of the puzzle to solving the off-road vehicle stability issue. And after this, there should be no more need for contract dollars on this. Uh, and we will be able to present solutions in house. I just want to make sure that we don't have other planned studies on this after this one. Is that right? I, I couldn't possibly say that once we get to the end of a contract, we'll certainly review it and look to uh, ideally moving forward in a way that helps protect consumers. But I can't predict what a contract is going to say. Oh, I'm, I, so on this one, I, I guess what I'm asking is we don't have a planned this, this would be the last one we have planned. We don't have another one planned. I, correct. This. I mean, I think once we get to the end of this, there's currently a project ongoing. This project would add to our base of knowledge. And I think at that point in time, staff would come back with recommendations based on this. Thank you. But correct. There's there's okay. no other plan. Okay. Appreciate that. Uh, items five and six, and I know you touched on these a little bit uh, already, the bicycle standards and data review and the bicycle engineering review non-fire. Yeah. Can you explain how these two interrelate I mean, is it possible to do them simultaneously or, or does five need to happen before six? Just how, how do those two work together? Sure. No, they, they can certainly be happening simultaneously. Um, 
because they're taking different approaches to the category, right, of, of, of electric bikes. So the, the engineering review is um, literally testing bikes, uh, and e-bikes, pardon me. Um, so it's going to work on giving us more information about design, construction differences, may explain some of the user control issues that were cited in the 2022 micromobility report. Okay. The... Um, the other project is looking uh, at data that we already have in house and, and helping us analyze it to Im ideally improve standards, whether those be voluntary or otherwise. Um, and we'll also take a look at existing international standards. You know, we, we've spent a lot of time looking yeah. at some standards. This will help us expand uh, our base of knowledge with respect to other standards. Oh, so great. they can definitely be done simultaneously. Okay, excellent. Um, item nine, PFAS, that's a topic I'm extremely interested in. I'm glad to see it on here. Um, can you tell me what we hope to learn from this work and, and how it could inform rulemaking? So, th so, so this project will build on our existing work. Um, as you know, we recently completed a, uh, a market and use information study uh, involving PFAS. Um, so the, 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 I'm just trying to check my notes here. The, the idea here is it will include some product testing, which will measure chemical content um, and emissions parameters, which would support our, our exposure modeling from a range of different products with respect to PFAS um, and help us consider different chemical pro PFAS chemical product combinations. Um, and it's important to note this aligns with, but does not overlap uh, specifically with our existing efforts to work on voluntary standards uh, in the voluntary standards context. So this this is additive to what we're already doing. Have we already determined that the like the product categories that we're going to be looking at in in this analysis? Um, I would need to get back to you on that. I mean, I think what this does is, you know, we just completed this market and use study, I think this turns to helping us figure out which products we should be most focusing on, but I'll okay. get back to you on that. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, OFRs, I, I, uh, you know, Commissioner Feldman, you touched on this a little bit. Um, you know, it's a chemical hazard that I definitely think we should regulate. We spent years and millions of dollars on it so far. Uh, and here we see items 11, 13, and 14 asking for another 825,000. I think it's time to move forward with what we have. And NPR doesn't need to provide the final answer on every aspect of a problem. So if these don't get funded, um, I hope we can inform ourselves through the comment period and continue to supplement with more research as it comes along. So I, I do urge us to move forward there. Uh, on the cutting room floor document, moving on to that one. Um, uh, can you provide any more detail? And maybe uh, Ms. Brings or, or Ms. Murray, this would be you. Uh, on item three, the ATV safety campaign. Uh, I'm curious on what that looks like, the hazard we're hoping to address, what's the message we're going to be spreading with that, where do we target it geographically, through what mediums, um, and I guess I'll stop there for an answer. So I'm happy to start, and then Ms. Springs, if you want. Okay. Um, so I would note, uh, for those watching, so th these are projects that were not proposed, uh, but these are projects that were considered, so I just think for for viewers that, that this was not made available to them. Um, to our wide audience of viewers, thank you. So, um, but the the project generally speaking, as, as you're well aware, ATVs have historically been a leading cause of death in terms of consumer products. Uh, this would be an add-on effort, I think important to note, um, to our annual information education campaign around ATV safety. Um, but this is mainly, this is a, the concept here is to focus on paved roads uh, and um, which is a leading cause uh, of ATV deaths. In other words, ATVs being used on paved roads, uh, which leads to a lot of rollovers and crashes. I don't know if you want to yeah. go from take it from there. Uh, push. Yeah. Yes, Commissioner. The 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 general message would be to keep people off of paved roads, since our data show that that's where most of the accidents happen. This would be a digital. Uh, campaign um, in areas where our data show us that um, most of these um, accidents occur, areas like West Virginia, Texas, I can supply a full list afterwards. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to take any additional Well, questions. I think the last related question here is, do we have evidence, because we, we've, we've had some communications on this already, 
maybe not as specific to the pay of road issue, but do we have evidence that our communications about ATV safety are changing consumer behavior so far? What we can tell you is that our messaging um, and the, the assets that we put out are resonating with consumers, both by clicks on our website, um, engagement with social media. So, you know, our hope is that if we, um, you know, provide additional engagement, we would be able to amplify that. Okay. Thank you. My time is up. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Boyle. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Levine and Mr. Baker and everyone else who worked on putting this package together. Um, I do, I'm happy to say that the, the commission has been very active in rulemaking uh, in the last couple of years, magnets, infant sleep products, window coverings, CSUs, hopefully portable generators, and we have several other on the list. And that um, raises the question of enforcement and the need for staff to enforce those rules. And so I wanted to ask, about uh, an amendment uh, that Commissioner Feldman offered for the operating plan in 2020, for the 2023 operating plan that was adopted, uh, and that was to direct the, uh, that the commission, and I'll read it, for any fiscal year 2023 annual appropriation above $143.45 million, the Office of Compliance is authorized to hire up to five new full-time equivalent staff to support increased investigation and litigation activity, and the Office of the General Counsel is authorized to hire one FTE to support this compliance function. Uh, the mid-year package does not address that direction from the Commission, nor does it, I think, prioritize those compliance functions, so I wanted to ask you um, how you uh, how you respond to that and how you would address that. Sure, thank you for the question. I, I think the, uh, the the short answer is unfortunately um, the funds were not available. Uh, while the the footnote footnote eight does authorize that raising of what we call the FTE cap uh, from five thirty nine up, I suppose in that case to 545. Uh, on the appropriated side, the direction in the operating plan and our previous communications to Congress with respect to moving the ARPA staff over uh, were seen as taking precedent uh, and hence moving the 37 uh, folks over to our full-time roles, many of whom are uh, compliance and, and field officers, sorry, port and compliance officers. Um, were seen as taking precedent, and so uh, the while authorized, uh, unfortunately, the funds were not available. But is it possible if one of the projects that are on the list that you put forward wasn't funded? If I just did the math, it's about a million dollars, right, for five or six employees, Mr. Baker. If uh, is that a re roughly correct? If we did fund one of these projects, we could authorize the hiring of those additional compliance um, personnel. Yes, but um, we could. Uh, however, um, as noted, these are unexecuted balances based on our appropriations level, so we would not necessarily expect to have that increase funding available for next year. So we might wind up in a situation where we would not have funds to keep them on our rolls. So while we- Forgive me if I'm missing something, is not the same issue with transferring the ARPA personnel over? Yes. Yeah. Uh, no. Absolutely. So, I mean, so the the question is simply how we can move folks over. I mean, I think the the distinction being with ARPA, there remain funds at least for a limited period of time uh, to move uh, ARPA FTEs back over to ARPA ARPA FTEs uh, back over to ARPA versus uh, for our appropriated line. It, we you know if if we wind up at a continuing continuing resolution level or lower those funds are not there. Um, so it's, it's, it's simply a question of we could do it. Uh, the, the staff proposed um, what we believe to be the most direct interpretation, but th there's no reason that the commission could not choose to add to the cap and we could start the process of, of raising those levels. We would just need to adjust uh, what's being um, projected and what's being done. And that million dollars in contracting not only uh, might slip uh, for fiscal 23, but might not be available for fiscal 24. And that, that's certainly a choice the commission can make. Okay, thank you. I appreciate sure, absolutely. that. Absolutely. Okay, uh, I did have several questions on batteries, but my colleagues have uh, asked uh, several of those, so I, I won't uh, belabor 
that. And similarly, uh, Commissioner uh, Trumka did raise the questions uh, on e-bike safety that I ha was, ha have been interested in. I raised the question of e-bike safety at the operating plan uh, discussion period uh, and, um, you know, Congress authorized uh, the commission 20 years ago to can uh, promulgate regulations specifically for e-bikes. Uh, and I think we may be looking at a time that that to take that a little bit more seriously, given um, the rise in use uh, and the uh, green economy that seems to be embracing that form of transportation. So I would just echo uh, my appreciation to see that those projects are are in are in the project are in the list. So thank you very much for that. Um, Another question I had would be uh, that I raised also in, uh, in the operating plan period was infant safety and, and how uh, we need to continue to do research and focus on that. Uh, and it does appear noteworth noteworthy to me that there aren't any projects listed uh, either in the unexecuted balances or I think in ARPA that uh, addresses uh, additional research and looking at emerging products that uh, we might be um, uh, studying. So if you could address that, I would appreciate it. Sure. And, and thank you for the question and thank you for the continued focus on this obviously critical area uh, of, of interest. Um, you know, while it's accurate to say that, I, you know, there's not a specific um, project listed uh, other than uh, an information education campaign in, in this space in, in the package, you know, we would note that there are a large variety of ongoing activities with respect to uh, infant um, infant safety and infant hazards, whether we're talking about NPRs for bassinets, infant pillows, nursing pillows, uh, rockers, and, and additional activities, our enforcement activity around safe sleep for babies, and our variety of voluntary standards. I think there's about 25 that uh, go, go to these questions. Uh, you know, we'd also note that some of these projects that we're discussing, you know, and maybe amongst the, the ones to highlight would be uh, the artificial intelligence machine learning training data project. You know, we think that'll help everything, but a particular focus of the agency has long been and should be uh, infant safety. And so we'd imagine we'd be able to learn a lot more about um, reports involving infants uh, and and injuries and deaths uh, from being able to to read that data more quickly. Uh, PFOS work certainly goes to it, but I think, so all that said, I think your, your larger question is around, um, what else could we do? If, if that's fair, if, if, if my interpretation is correct in terms of research and yep. long term study, as there are constantly new products uh, and unexplained infant deaths that continue to be a source of concern for. All of us here, and uh, and so I I just noted that there wasn't something additional on yep. the list and and. Um, that's true. It's an it's a correct observation. I think the uh, there there has been a consideration uh, and a project around a study on infants uh, safe sleep, um, and it has not been funded for a variety of of reasons for a variety of years, um, due to resource and timing limitations. Uh, quite frankly, and 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 the ability to execute in, in a in a timely and and cost effective way but certainly there uh, has been uh, a concept of a project around a literature review of infant deaths working with outside experts uh, on some of these issues um, and it's something that can always be revisited uh, again resource and, and timing being a question but happy to work with you on it okay thank you uh, thank you mr chair I'll, i think i'll just wait for the next round Thank you, Commissioner. Um, appreciate also, as you pointed out, it's been a long time since the bike standard has been reviewed and updated. Um, so uh, I appreciate you focusing in on these issues going going forward as well. Um, actually, I'm going to turn to Commissioner Feldman. So for the next round of questions to start. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I only have a couple additional questions, so uh, hopefully this won't take very long. But I, I did want to ask about uh, priority item number four, uh, which concerns ATV rollover protection. Um, Mr. Levine, I, I, I want to know a little bit more about the proposed project um, in the context of what we've heard from Congress. Congress has restricted CPSCs uh, uh, from advancing a, a rule on recreational off-highway vehicles. Um, 
regarding lateral stability uh, until the National Academies completes its report to determine the technical validity of the proposed lateral stability and vehicle handling requirements. Um, I, I recognize that uh, it's a different product category, ATVs versus ROVs. Um, and obviously, uh, the the uh, proposal in item number four concerns ATVs, where we're restricted on on ROVs. But I, I'm curious about sort of the 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 subject that we're probing here and what we hope to find. Would would this project raise the same sort of technical validity concerns that Congress has addressed and criticized in our other previous work? Well, I certainly hope not. I mean, the the, the concept here is an examining injury and incident data. One of the most common uh, scenarios are, are rollovers, uh, and so uh, unlike with ROVs, which have, um, as you're familiar, often um, you know, roll cages and 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 other rollover protection issues and wider stability, ATVs don't, uh, and so this looks at uh, rollover protection uh, and and some of the uh, variety of technologies that have been. Uh, examined in this space and intend to help inform uh, all stakeholders and whether that be in a mandatory standard context, voluntary standard context, uh, you know, we, we think it's, it is helpful research to provide this information um, because, you know, trying to get after this specific incident scenario, which we know is remains um, a stubborn one. Okay. Thank you. Um... I want to ask about the Consumer Product Safety Risk Management Protection System, or the CPSRMS. Uh, can you explain item number eight, the, the CPSRMS documentation? I see that staff's proposing to spend over a quarter million dollars on the CPSRMS documentation, but the, the description of the project, uh, frankly, is a little confusing. Can, can you explain what the project is and, and how it will advance our mission? Yes. Um, so, CPS, CPS RMS is one of. You guys could have picked an easier acronym. I wasn't at the meeting. Um, so the 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 RMS, which is is how we generally refer to it, because CPS RMS is is a mouthful. Um, will provide. So this, what this project will provide is. Uh, our ability to basically preserve the the utility of our risk management system for our internal uh, enforcement process. Because right now it is, um, uh, as many of our legacy systems are, it, it was built sort of piece by piece without sort of, you know, as, as these technologies were developed over our 50 Coming up on 51 year history, they weren't necessarily developed in a, in a in a holistic way that allows us to take advantage of modern uh, technologies, modern software applications, um, and we are now in the process of doing that. And so, we, you know, we've talked a lot about moving our systems to the cloud. We've talked a lot about the ability to move things in, into a data lake and use more advanced technology to access those systems. What the, this project will help us do is as those transitions take place, do so in a way that will allow us to categorize um, and more effectively utilize the individual siloed pieces of the RMS um, in our new environment. So, so this is an important because Quite frankly, if we don't undertake this sort of project, when we do make these transitions, whether um, because we we have to, because uh, software has no longer and and software and hardware is no longer supportable, or because we want to, because we see uh, enterprise opportunities to be successful, if we don't have a better understanding of what we're moving and how we're moving it, it is going to be just as jumbled and ineffective, even in a new, more modern environment. And so this will help us as we make those transitions and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but okay. All right. There we go. I appreciate that. Um, given the last sentence in the product description on page seven, that explains that, uh, the, the project will also be used, uh, for requirements generation for a CPRMS replacement, which will likely become necessary in the coming years. Um, should we treat this as a one-time expense or is staff anticipating additional future expenditures, uh, in 
the operating plan and beyond the, the 2024 well, operating right. plan. So it depends on what we mean by this. I, I, I think this portion is one time the, the upgrading and modernization of CPS RMS is not a one time expense. So okay. it depends on sort of how you break it. It would be useful to get a projected spend. Sure. Um, and obviously that's looking a little bit into the future, but uh, just to have, have uh, a slightly more clarity on that, I think would be helpful. Uh, with that, I have no further questions. I appreciate staff, uh, your time. Thank you, uh, Mr. Baker, Mr. Levine, uh, everybody, appreciate it. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Trumka. Thanks. Um, just my last question on the cutting room floor document is with item four about spokesperson collaboration. If we did this, do we have specific topics in mind that we would want to do there? So my understanding, and the screens can correct correct me, but um, again, because the project was not brought forth, it wasn't necessarily brought to completion, but uh, the goal is with these collaboration, reach communities that we know are disproportionately impacted, whether we're talking about black communities, Hispanic communities, Native American communities, uh, about hazards uh, that are obviously within our jurisdiction um, from voices that they know and trust. And that, that's sort of the, the concept. Um, and I don't know if there's more to speak to on that. No, I think you captured it all. So, so we don't have specific subject matters that we might want to hit if we did this. Could you? I think the the subject matters would relate to the the hazards that we know impact these communities: baby safety, CO safety, fire safety, um, those okay. kinds of hazards. Well, sound like good ideas. Okay. Um, that, that's all on that on that document. I want to move on to the ARPA one time costs. I love to see item one, the website redesign. It's sorely needed. I really hope that cpsc.gov becomes a place that consumers actually go to to look for information. Uh, one question on the website redesign, and, and maybe this is for our chief information officer. Uh, this is the stage where it's easiest to kind of build in universal tools, as I would understand it. Uh, and so integrating something like a transla uh, translation tool into our website so that we had everything available in multiple languages, would this be the easiest time to do something like that if we were going to do it? Afternoon, everybody. Thank you for having me here. So at my prior agency, we did a complete, uh, that would be the EEOC, we did a complete website redesign and built a structure that supported multiple languages because you need everything, the images, the, the error messages, everything has to be supportive of multiple languages. So it is an ideal time when you're doing a redesign to think about how can we structure this so that it's easy to provide multiple languages? While the technology that supports translations increases and it gets better every single day, uh, we still pay people uh, to at the EOC to do those translations for us. But the, the information that was presented, the structure of the website made it easy to see what was available in other languages and how to, how to get to that information quickly. So, so it does make sense. And, you know, we have, we have a budget here for human translators as well later in the document. So the question is, it sounded like a yes, that if we wanted to build the website as we redesign it in a way that could support translation tools, now's the time. Absolutely. And, and we could bake that into this million dollar contract. I think the design can, can accept multiple languages. Uh, I don't know exactly at this point how much the million dollars will buy us. Could we maybe follow up on that? Because I think it'd be a good idea to, if we can do it, to include it in this project. If Absolutely. we're going to be building it, let's build it right. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Um, and, and I see in item two, I very much like to see the nice special special investigations on D. That was my only technology question on that. So I, <laughs> I appreciate it. Okay. Up to you whether. Um, but the nice investigation on e-bikes, uh, can, can you explain what we're hoping to learn there and how that uh, could feed into a rulemaking process to make e-bikes safer? Sure. So as a, a macro level on how um, special studies work w within NICE, uh, the, the construct is, um, as you know, for, we have a sample of hospitals across the country uh, where incident reports are then uh, fed through a model to give us nationwide estimates. But those um, those individual incident reports are um, significant in nature, but don't always have all of the information that we might want and think about a product um, that uh, a similar product to an e-bike, let's say a scooter that is involved in a visit to an emergency department, there's an injury, 
a child breaks their arm, parent says happened on a scooter. It's not, you know, immediately important necessarily to the admitting uh, personnel to identify whether that was an electric scooter or a a foot pedal. Oh, so like our ATV, OHV, that kind of problem, we, we, we unpack yeah. it. Right. Okay. So the special study here would be for e-bikes in that same, in that same issue. So okay. digging into each of those individual um, uh, incidents over the course of a full year, which would then provide us uh, with a significant data set uh, that helps us identify both for, for, for all the variety of reasons, all the variety of ways that we use that tech, that information. Okay. And I also wanted to touch on item 10 uh, from the ARPA one-time spend. Uh, I wanted to give you a chance to talk about, and Ms. Springs, I think this is something you alluded to earlier with reaching out to targeted communities, but if you could explain to us what we're hoping to accomplish with this project, it feels like a really great idea, and I just wanted to give you a chance to elaborate on it. Here you go. Pam. Right here. There you go. Pam. Okay. With the DEI community outreach grassroots program, and I'll read you the sentence that I was curious about that might help as well. You've got the last sentence in there updating, producing and distributing safety related collateral for distributing directly to these audiences and through external stakeholder organizations. It sounds like a great idea and I just wanted to give you a chance to tell us about what that looks like. Sure, we've got a, a great and active field staff um, that's on the ground every day, um, reaching out to communities, both um, uh, from the compliance standpoint, but they also are great feelers for us um, to connect with people in the community um, to help socialize our safety information. At the moment, um, that information is being distributed um, kind of ad hoc. They're asking us, you know, we need X number of pamphlets. And so the idea is to provide these people with uh, provide our colleagues rather with uh, the content that they need, the brochures, so that they can socialize more of our safety messaging um, throughout their uh, throughout their work. Okay, that, that's great. And, and Mr. Burden, I'm glad you didn't leave because I spoke too soon. I I think you might be able to help with this next one as well. And, and I think with items three through seven on this list, these relate to tech upgrades. Commissioner Feldman, you alluded to it before that you know we want to make sure we do this right and. I want to make sure we understand them. So, so people tend to gloss over some of these and assume that we won't understand them. But if, if you could lay out items three through seven in layman's terms, maybe just a sentence, even if you can, what's the capability that we currently lack and, and what new capability does this give us? Okay. Thank you. So, why don't I start and then you fill in on this. Why don't we do it that way? Um, so let's start, um, with, um, well, we already talked, I think, a little bit about the AI and ML project. I don't know if that's something you wanted to continue to cover, Mr. Commissioner. If you could maybe just resummarize it for us in a sense, what capability do we lack? What do we gain? How do we gain that capability here? Sure. Uh, we don't currently have a an automated fashion for reading unstructured text. Uh, ideally, if this project is successful, it would allow us to read unstructured text in an automated fashion, a way to identify um, product codes and uh, injury and incident severity. Perfect, thank you. Yeah. Uh, item four, no, sorry, I'm on the wrong, I'm on the wrong list. Give me one second here. Uh, I believe it's IDI right, data the collection. I, correct, the IDI. So currently, um, as we've talked about with unfortunately many of our, uh, our data collection systems, both from a compliance standpoint and otherwise are outdated, uh, this, provides our uh, our field officers when they're doing in-depth investigations, the ability to upload the, the investigatory report and the collateral materials that come with it in a fashion that is uh, appropriate in 2023. So they're not using um, incredibly old sort of PDFs uh, to, to do that. And this will allow that information not only to be uh, centrally located in terms of finding it, but also more easily searchable. Okay. May, may I add to that? Yeah. So slightly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so to, there's no system today. So it's all managed with these fillable PDFs that are submitted back to, to the office. Uh, this will be replacing those PDFs with forms, fillable forms. It's as Mr. Levine says, 2023. Uh, and, uh, uh, I think last year they did a pilot for one of these forms. So, so this has already been piloted. We know how to do it. Uh, we know how much it costs to do that pilot. And I think this is just an extrapolation to replace all the, the standard PDFs that, with those forms. So that one sounds like it'd be a time saver and you'd gain accuracy by not having to re-enter. 100%. Okay, excellent. Uh, number 
Five goes to our epidemiology systems being modernized. Uh, we currently have um, 11 different apps involved in our, in our epidemiology systems and seven third-party integrated services. Uh, and this will continue uh, the, the project of modernizing those systems, consolidating uh, our, our legacy applications, which are, are starting to come offline in terms of being supported, um, which ideally will help us improve efficiency and effectiveness. Uh, and one example that uh, is already in, in play is, for example, Web Nice. Uh, our nice hospitals used to be dependent upon us providing hardware, you know, physical laptops that they needed to plug into their system. Uh, this, uh, the upgrade that has already happened uh, allows for uh, them to participate in the program online. Uh, I, I'm happy to continue or. I would just say it's the second year of a three year project. Yeah. I think you want me to just come back to those last two. No, well, it's, it's that question, just the answer. I don't have more. I, I can do it on my next try and get that answer if you want. You can have more time. <laughs> well, I'm just to let the, the answer keep going. I don't have another question. No, that was the, that was the oh, end. Oh, I, I know, but, but, for item six and, but for item six, six and seven. Six and, seven I... and, and I can go back to those and get that answer later. So feel free to. Sure, why don't we just go through the normal rounds? And um, so we'll go through another round of questions. But Commissioner Boyle, do you have a uh, question? I have a couple. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I wanted to ask about item uh, 15 on unexecuted balances on the smart enabled products. If you could just explain uh, what uh, you hope to get out of that project and what it entails. Yes, but I need to grab my notes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, this was, sorry, yes, okay. Um, so thank you for the question and the patience. Uh, so the, the concept here is expanding our current understanding, which is exists, but is relatively limited when we talk about AI enabled or related consumer products. Um, so we have seen reports um, of, of threats or potential hazards and, and a range of, of, of IoT, Internet of Things related products, such as thermostats, furnaces, oven ranges, space heaters, fireplace inserts uh, in that space. So connected technology. Um, this work would um, help, and, and we continue to work in the, in, in the voluntary standard space uh, around those those products, but helping us um, continue to develop testing methodologies to support compliance work when we're talking about uh, IoT and AI related uh, products needs more um, research on our part and, and more uh, more resources. So uh, the the plan here would be to purchase some products that are uh, AI related, AI enabled, uh, evaluate them in house. Um, using principles established by our AI team um, and then extrapolate from those learnings uh, in addition to our continued participation with um, OST, you know, White House's OSTP on these issues and, and a variety of other um, stakeholder groups in the space. So you mean purchase different categories of products? We've done such similar testing already. Is that what? Correct. Okay. And, and help us continue to understand them better and develop testing methods around them. Okay. I mean, I, I think it's fair to say that AI certainly is in the news a lot lately and rapidly uh, emerging and changing technologies seems to be something we should obviously be focusing on. So I'm a bit um, surprised to see uh, it at the bottom of your list. And is that does that indicate that it's not a top priority or well i i think for us this is more of the the cutting edge of the question i think where our data has suggested is um these are risks as opposed to um ongoing active significant incident reports uh and so many of the you know when we're talking about internet of things enabled devices uh, many of the risks go more to the uh, the cyber and the, the privacy side than necessarily the physical injury side. But we want to continue to stay abreast of of these active of of these products and these potential hazards, um, which is why we participate in 
a, a wide variety of, of stakeholder um, uh, activities that allow us to, to maintain uh, a foothold in the space, continue to be aware of what's going on, but based on you know the, the the difficult choices we always have to make in terms of where to apply the resources. Um, this is where we put it forward. So, would the bulk of the three hundred thousand be for equipment and product purchases versus? I believe it, it would be for for product purchases. We can get back to you on on the exact. But okay, I the and I'd be yes. Yeah, sorry, to yep. interrupt. I'd no, be no. interested to understand better uh, how. Uh, purchasing different product categories um, really expands our knowledge of the fundamental issues related to software and the technology that we're talking about. You know, is it really substantially different in a stove versus a refrigerator versus looking at the more kind of uh, fundamental issues related to this? We'll circle back. Okay, thank you. Um, and then the other question I had was, um, uh, about embedding equity in our research and our data. I think staff in September of 2022 uh, issued a report uh, on, uh, I think it was titled, The Investigation on Racial and Socioeconomic Differences, Race, Ethnicity, and Socioeconomic Data and Consumer Product Safety. And in that, and I'll quote from it, uh, it explains that, quote, EXHR will continue actively to seek opportunities to identify and evaluate consumer safety equity issues and allocate safety work toward equity and consumer product safety. Um, do you have plans or can you elaborate on the plans that you uh, to evaluate and pursue equity issues within the EXHR products specifically that are proposed in the mid-year funding? Sure. Thank you for the question. I, and I think um, similar to where we talked about infant safety, you know, there's not a specific project um, from the EXHR perspective that is solely focused in, in this question. Um, so I believe there's two uh I believe there's two OCM related projects in the package um, on this note, but I would say that consumer safety and equity issues are sort of included in many, if not most of the projects that we talk about in the base funding. Um, so when we talk about, um, as, as mentioned similarly, you know, it seems like it's keep coming back to it. Um, the, the, the ability to uh, undertake review of unstructured text in a way that will give us far more information than we currently have about actual incidents as opposed to projected uh, is going to be super significant as we uh, attempt to get deeper into safety differences by demographic subgroup uh, is something that we think is is going to be helpful uh, as as we move along um, the the RMS documentation project um, is again part of our larger effort to modernize our data systems, which will hopefully allow for better access to our data by all of our all of our staffers. Um, and as we improve these systems, that's again necessary to help us apply uh, all these new tools that we're talking about to pull out better data sets around trying to focus on equity issues. Um, you know, and and I mean I think one of the things we've learned with going through our current data, as we learned in the, in the recent imputation report, is we're lacking in the current capabilities to best identify in multiple categories. We certainly identified some categories, uh, as, as Ms. Springs mentioned, you know, we're talking about you know, carbon dioxide and drowning prevention and fire, but there are more categories out there that we want to get a better sense of how we can help address um, at a community level that we're not yet able to mine the data in a way that will help us expand on that. And so while they are not, so some of these IT projects we're talking about may not seem directly um, labeled uh, as speaking to some of these equity issues, we do believe they will be uh, helpful and eventually decisive, you know, maybe not necessarily in 12 months, but eventually decisive in helping us push these issues forward. Thank you very much. And thank you to all. I'm done, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Boyle. Thank you for raising the diversity and equity issues. And I would say, ask Mr. Levine slash encourage um, that, you know, whether it's HR compliance or all the rest, that these issues would be part of any thinking and work that they're doing, that they are looking at if there are um, disparities, um, disparate impacts that are going on as, as they're doing. So I, I 
assume that's the case from the, how the commission has pushed in the past, but maybe you can confirm that, that, that that's the case. Yes. Um, going to another round of questions, Commissioner. No question, Commissioner Trumka. Uh, we've got several ARPA projects that touch on NICE, our hospital data reporting system. How's recruiting uh, stand for NICE? I mean, how many do we have in the program and how does that line up with our goal? Sure. So, um, and thank you for the question. And, and um, you know, NICE is uh, such an important uh, backbone of, of our data collection system. So it is, you know, we're, we're always glad I'm looking for my notes while I'm talking, but we're always glad for, for commission interest in, in shoring up our, um, the system. So I, I think it's important, you know, that we recognize that, you know, the nice hospitals, what's, what's most important is um, having a, ah, there we go, uh, having a, a representative sample from the country. So it's not necessarily the number, you know, so for example, we go out and recruit uh, 200 hospitals, if they're all the same size hospitals in the same region, uh, they're all, say, urban, that doesn't necessarily give us the, the the scope that we're looking for in terms of being able to make national estimates. Um, so, uh, you know, that said, we can get back on the exact numbers, but, you know, our goal is to have that representative sample. Recruiting has been a little bit slower than we had hoped. We had undertaken, starting last year, a, a large effort to, uh, with the help of a contractor to recruit new hospitals. We found COVID to be a significant impediment to, um, to the recruiting, not so much uh, uh, on our end necessarily, but hospitals, as you can imagine, particularly emergency departments uh, were distracted. Uh, we are starting to see some uh, return to normal on that. We've recently uh, had an uptick in some of our recruiting. Uh, so the numbers are starting to come back. Uh, we've added four small hospitals just this fiscal year alone, uh, and we're close to adding a few more at this moment. Uh, we are, and we're coming to the end of a two-year contract uh, with, with an outside uh, vendor to help us with recruiting. I think as um, as we get to the end of that contract, you know, we, we're not necessarily uh, suggesting moving forward with an option year on that because. Uh, for a variety of reasons, uh, we believe we have the continued opportunity to recruit um, otherwise, but I think we, we're going to continue to need to uh, find ways to make sure it's stable. But I will note um, our current sample has been um, looked at by the outside, by OMB, uh, as, as uh, satisfactory through 2025. Um, so we do have uh, time to continue to, to keep moving that forward. But So it's slow, but it's coming on. But, and we can get back to it, brother. And, and definitely accepting that our our sample size is good enough to project the things we're doing, but yep. but more data is better. And, and I was just curious sure. how we're doing there. So we have a current contract. It it goes through when? The end of this fiscal year. It's the end of this fiscal year. My my question was going to be, do we need to allocate more funds? But but we wouldn't have to do that in the mid year if we're tied up through the end of this year, right? Well, if we were to expect, I mean, so it's it's the delivery is through the end of the fiscal year. So we don't need to do anything more to, to finish this fiscal year. The right. question would be, do we um, expend more funds to uh, ask the, to, to contract with this firm to help us continue recruiting the way it's doing. So start, you know, as of October one fiscal 20, you know, 2023, mm -hmm. uh, we have not put that forth as a recommendation. Obviously the commission could choose to do otherwise. Um, well, maybe we should maybe talk about that some more as we get closer to that date and, and think about what makes sense there. Uh, so, but, but a lot of the funding goes to contracts and, um, you know, we don't have a ton of visibility as commissioners into that contracting process until, you know, we've already posted a solicitation, we get bids, and then we find out who gets it afterwards. Um, I'd really love to help spread the word on those and make sure that we get a wide enough pool to, to make sure we're getting the best candidates to do these things. So I was thinking about whether we could put something in this mid-year that would have some sort of regular briefings for us on upcoming solicitations. Um, you know, it, it doesn't need to be an amendment here because we're just talking about periodic, maybe quarterly briefings. Is that something you think you could provide uh, to us on solicitations? Um, you know, certainly we're happy to try and provide whatever information the commission needs. I mean, I'd say we do 300 plus solicitations a year. Uh, so it's it's a pretty significant lift if we're talking about briefing on every single one of them. Well, and it wouldn't need to be that. I'm thinking quarterly, and it could be a list. And if we have questions on each specific ones, we could ask questions. Um, sure. And and you know, I mean, I think we of course want to make sure that um, 
you know, we're, we're following federal acquisition regulations. Um, there's, as you well, well aware, there's a tremendous number of regulations around um, federal contracting. We want to make sure we're staying with it, but mm -hmm. anything we can do to increase the pool of, um, of, uh, of com competition on, on our contracts is certainly something we should talk about um, finding ways to promote. So great. Well, I hope we can do those briefings and I, I think hopefully we can contribute to that process. Um, you know, because this is, this is my second mid year here. Um, I think it's important to look back on the last one to kind of inform how we handle this one. And so I want to ask about what happened with the last one that we did and we had put in several amendments and haven't quite heard back on what the result was. And so I was hoping we could cover a little bit of that as well. So starting with SAS VIA, and this was a, an amendment that, that I put forward, and it was investment in technology that would help us do our jobs better, uh, we were told there. So the amendment allocated 2.2 million of ARPA funds to migrate from SAS 9.4 to SAS VIA, and we anticipated the, the investment would expand our data analysis capabilities and allow us to run analyses faster, uh, significantly faster. For example, it came with the ability to mine text data and allow patterns to be discerned easier including harms to disadvantaged groups. So how is the implementation on that one gone? Uh, what new capabilities have we gained? And can you provide any examples of, of why that added value? Sure, so, and, and I think for this project and, and all mid-year projects and sort of the project we're talking about today also, I think it's important to remember uh, sort of the, the contracting period, right? So the, the contracts, uh, particularly for the unexecuted balances, but similar for ARPA, funds, right? We'll take over the next few months, maybe even more than that, to execute those contracts, uh, which will then have a performance period of 12 months or more, depending upon the contract. So um, some of these are still in process. Uh, and 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 the implementation of SAS VIA is, is one of those. And unfortunately, it's gone a little bit slower than we had hoped. There were some delays due to um, what's called an authority to operate uh, license, which we have now gained, um, and the installation is starting to pick up a little more speed, uh, and, and no small thanks to uh, our, our CIO shop um, in terms of, of getting what we paid for and, and getting the, um, the contract to provide and the contractor to provide what we asked for. And so it's, it's a multi-step process, right? There, there's training of our staff, there's migration of, of data, and there's integration of our existing systems. And so, so if we think about it that way, um, we, the training has begun for our staff to use the new tool once it has been implemented. Um, and they're already beginning to work in what we call the non-production environment. Um, so they're, they're starting to actually learn how to employ the training that uh, that SAS is, is providing. Um, and so that's one, my, the migration piece uh, of uh, has, has also begun for us um, is not yet complete. Um, and then the, the, the integration of our existing systems uh, is also ongoing and is speeding up. Uh, I think we're going to start seeing some more um, results coming this fall, but I think we're still, you know, we're, we're still in, we're still a bit of a catch up process um, that, that Brian could speak to a little bit. Okay. But, th but this one's bought and paid for. We're waiting on implementation to start seeing the benefits. Correct. Yeah. It's, it's an ongoing, okay. right. It's an ongoing uh, integration of a, uh, of a, of a tool that, that our people, once it's fully integrated, will be able to use. Okay. Um, we also allocated 200,000 uh, of ARPA funds for a consumer behavior study to quote, direct the Office of Communications in consultation with the Division of Human Factors to conduct a study on consumer behavior regarding recalls and factors relating to consumer willingness to report consumer product injuries, including but not limited to through the use of focus groups of consumer representatives of the U.S. population. So how did the study go? What did we learn and, and what benefits are we gaining from it? Right. So this would be another example of one that is just really getting going because of the time it takes to get these things up and running. Okay. So OMB just approved the focus groups. Okay. Um, so um, the contract, I think, asked for a report by the end of summer 23. So hopefully, okay. you know, we'll have something soon. Um, yeah, are we still on track for that? Uh, it, Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Look forward to it. Um, uh, let's see. We also funded a project on population attributable risk, uh, which we understood to be a tool for assessing the impact of chronic hazards on specific populations, including low-income and minority communities. 
I won't go through my, what's the update on that one? Where do we stand with that? Sure. Um, contractors have completed, nearly completed, is the report I'm getting, uh, the first phase, which is developing uh, the early version of a tool which would estimate the number of deaths and injuries that may result from specific, specific chemical exposures. So we are, um, we are get. We just had a demonstration for our technical staff on the 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 beta version of the model, um, which we sent back some um, some tweaks to that we'd like to see, uh, and we're hoping to see the final version of that um, the tool we're going to use to to undertake that that um, that estimation by uh, the end of April. So soon. Great. Thank you. My my time is up. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Wall does not yeah. know about additional questions. Commissioner Feldman, Commissioner Trumka. Sorry to keep <laughs> being the one who drags this on. Same line of questions. Last one, uh, web crawler. Um, same question. Where does that stand? Um, so th I mean, this one's had, an, and I know we've spoken to some of the office, some of you about this. Um, th this project has run into far more problems than I think we had anticipated uh, upon um, its conception in terms of making it work. And so far, no funds have been expended uh, on um, implementation because we have not yet been able to identify a contract vehicle that um, will produce what we what was proposed. And so I, you know, at this point, it has really been shrunk back down to looking at potentially doing um, something very small, um, in terms of a, a maybe looking at one specific website and product type, but it's really we've been unsuccessful in finding a solution that is um, realistic and cost effective um, based on where we started. So the, the short answer is um, it's, it has not moved very far forward. Uh, I think one of the things we are hoping is the type of 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 um, of end result from what we talked about in the AIML project, that project number three uh, could apply to the sort of um, websites and, and other activity that the web crawler imagined in addition to all the other pieces that we're talking about. So again, it's, it's essentially unstructured text and searching for it. Now it would take uh, pointing uh, the sort of tool that we're developing under that project at a given website uh, as opposed to a sort of free form crawl. Uh, however, we've been, I think it's important to note, our eSafe team has been incredibly successful, again, in a manual way, um, at at going ahead and, and doing some of the work that it's been doing, but in terms of developing a tool that is uh, able to find, um, particularly on, on the defect side, uh, trends and that sort of um, activity, We've been struggling, and 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 similarly, there there have been some, which I'd rather not discuss in this setting. Some legal questions around um, how uh, some of the other pieces would work. So, uh, the short answer is it's it's no money has been spent. I suppose is a good thing, uh, but it has not moved forward very very far. I mean that's that's disappointing. I mean I I know we were all excited about the capabilities. eSafe is doing great work. This would have let them do more of it and and do it easier and cover more ground. Um, so it's disappointing to hear that we don't have a solution on that. But I guess my question is, when did we know that? Well, this has become, um, you know, it's something that continues to develop and we continue to look for solutions. So, uh, you know, as I said, the current effort is to see if it can be shrunk and then brought back to the commission. Um, it was noted in the package that, you know, zero dollars had been spent on this um, uh, in the in the ARPA table. Um, actually, sorry, not in the package in, in one of the, the, um, the collateral materials that was distributed. Uh, it's the blue and green chart, uh, or table, I should say. Um, That's right. I'm not sure I've seen that, but, but I guess the question is, you know, we approved this in last year's mid year and things happen, you know, we can't always execute what we expect to, but I would definitely hope to be learning it earlier than this year's mid year that we didn't fund a required element of last year's. Um, so I'd really like us to have a process going forward that we could just learn this earlier on. Um, I, I'll stop there, but, but I guess one question is what happens with that money then? That's last year's money. Where do we put it? Well, again, it was part of ARPA. So it, it's, so that stays in ARPA. Okay. In, okay. 
So that just says, plan. and that, that money that we would have used on that will now, it's now part of the plan to be expended in what we have before us. Correct. Okay. Okay. Do you want to? Okay. All right. I, I don't have any more questions. Thank you. Thank you for, um, for answering all of these. Uh, appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner. No, well, I'm done. Thank you. No request for additional rounds. Um, with that, so thank you to staff for this uh, informative briefing. We're going to be reconvening next week to make final decisions on the mid year and our packages. So I look forward to working with my colleagues on um, finding a strong path forward for the agency on our spending and the projects that we're going to focus on. With that, this uh, briefing is concluded. And let's have 10 minutes to clear the room if that works for folks to. Lunch. Um, well, this is closed, so we're going to turn off the mic.